you. It's so good to be with you. Would you guys please build a church sanctuary so we could have a larger place to meet? It was like going across the 405 and California Highway trying to get from the prayer room to over here. And isn't it good to see what the Lord is doing here? I mean, it is just a, an amazing, amazing thing. One of the great highlights of for my wife and I coming here every few weeks or every couple of months is just getting a chance to see what the Lord is doing. I just kind of look around and just want to say, to God be the glory. What an amazing, amazing work He is doing. And uh, as, as Mark uh, shared a moment ago, it is, it is my great pleasure to be able to pray for this church, which I do uh, every single week. And uh, just overjoyed at seeing the, the goodness and, and kindness of the Lord being poured out on your congregation. In fact, one of the, one of the things I get the privilege to do is, is I get to write uh, a little bit for the website of the Master's Seminary. And uh, the article that I wrote that came out last week dealt specifically with uh, the importance of praying for other churches and other congregations. And, and one of the benefits of doing that is I feel like in, in some small way, uh, through, through praying every single week for this congregation, uh, I, I, get, I, get to, I get to rejoice with you. Uh, I get to see how the Lord is at work using all of our prayers. And when I, get to, when I come here and get to see your faces and follow online with what the Lord is doing, uh, I, I'm, I'm just overjoyed that, that my family gets to, to be a small part of, of the good things that the Lord is doing here. And so I have been blessed just, just by standing in front of you today and seeing uh, all the Lord has brought here. Uh, I, I've already been ministered to this morning and uh, pray through His Word uh, that you will be strengthened as well. We're looking at just an incredible passage this morning in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. Let me read this and set the context in front of us. Of course, we're in the, the upper room discourse here. And, and essentially, this is the Lord Jesus' final will and testament. These are His final words to His believers. And it is with an incredible sense of weight and sobriety that these words are given to us. Christ is looking squarely at the cross at this point. It will not be long until our Savior goes and is crucified on the tree. And everything that we sing about, and every promise that we claim, and every single hope that we cling to is ours because of the work Christ will do on the cross. Our salvation, our security, our peace, everything that we hold dear is due to what Christ will endure on our behalf. And as we come to John 14, the cross is just right there. He's preparing His disciples for what's about to happen and what they are about to experience is going to be something so vast and so amazing that through the work of the Spirit, these men are about to turn the world upside down. John 14, Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way. And the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. 
Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak in my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, in one sense, the text before us is clear. We understand, we believe, and we trust. And yet, in another sense, the words we have just read are so staggering that it seems impossible to be able to adequately convey the depth of all that is here in just a few minutes. Lord, it's possible for us to sing about the cross and to preach about the cross and it feels so familiar to us. Lord, may it never, never seem too familiar in the sense that we would miss its beauty, its glory. May it never be so common to us that we lose our sense of adoration and amazement at what you've done. And as we consider the words of John 14 today, may we too, as the hymn writer said, be lost in wonder, love, and praise. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, one of the parts of the Christian faith that is so important to understand is that we are Trinitarian. One God existing in the persons of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And while in one sense we can explain that and grasp that and worship the God revealed to us in in another way, it it is beyond all comprehension. What I want you to see as we walk through John 14 this morning is that the Trinitarian aspect of this passage And you see this as it unfolds. I'm just going to walk you through this with three main headings. First, I want you to notice that we will be in the Father's house. The message is entitled, The Promise of Home. And our promise of home tells us this, that we will be in the Father's house. Now, at the very beginning, something we need to deal with in verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. This isn't hypothetical. This is real. The hearts of his disciples are indeed troubled. In fact, the the wording and the language here communicates this to us as the, the rendering of this would be, stop allowing your hearts to be troubled. He's speaking to something that exists, that, that's present with them. The disciples are concerned. They are anxious. They are nervous. They are uncertain and unsure. And speaking to them, Jesus says, stop letting your hearts be troubled. Now, one of the things we want to do when we read the Bible and study it, even for ourselves at home each day, is we want to ask questions. When we come to things in the text, we want to stop and and not be too quick to move past certain words. And so we've got to stop and ask ourselves, not only why are they troubled, but there is something else that I want us to consider for a brief moment. As... Providence would have it, when I was here last time with you not long ago, John 12, verse 27, 
Jesus said, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. When I was with you a few weeks ago, we read the words of Jesus saying that his soul is troubled. Now in John 14, he tells his followers, do not let your hearts be troubled. Which the only thing I can conclude from that is that there must be a sense in which there is a godly troubling and an ungodly troubling. And I think we can see this unfold because in John 12, the Lord's heart is troubled because he knows that soon to come upon him is the wrath of the Father as payment for sin. And his answer in John 12 is, Father, glorify your name. The trouble that Christ feels is the the sorrow that understands just how awful sin is and just how serious the consequence of it is and anticipating the wrath of the Father to be poured out upon he who knew no sin. It troubles him. Troubles him at the depth of the wrath of God, and yet his heart is steadied as he realizes and confesses in John 12 that his greatest desire is not to escape pain. His greatest desire is that he could say, Father, glorify your name. The troubling you see in John 14 is the troubling that you and I often have ourselves. There's things that we don't know the answer to, and so we get anxious. There's things that we can't fully understand or explain, and the trouble that we feel, the trouble disciples felt in that day, is the trouble that comes when we get frustrated that we don't know the end from the beginning. And what we're required to do is to walk by faith. And so many times in the disciples' life, and for you and for me, what we have to keep in mind is our soul need not be troubled by our own limitation because we have a God who knows all and sees all. They don't need to be troubled because the one that's in control of all things is ruling and reigning forever and forever. So, friend, there may be things you don't understand There may be things you're uncertain of the end. Let not your hearts be troubled. You trust in your God. Amen? Amen. You trust in your God. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. This This is a staggering reality that he gives us. How is it that you fight troubled hearts? One word, belief. It's your belief in the Lord that gives you the the strength to fight unbelief. You believe, it drives out unbelief. You believe, it drives out troublesome hearts and spirits and minds. The way you fight the battle and the way you win the battle over a troubled heart is by believing in the Lord. This is why for those who don't know Christ, they're never going to find the peace they're looking for. Because there is no true lasting peace outside of belief in the Lord. And it may be even this morning that you find yourself grasping and reaching and trying with all of your might to find that peace that eludes you. My dear friend, you will not ever find it apart from believing in who the Lord Jesus Christ is. You fight for a peaceful spirit in the battle of belief because the battle is always won in the mind. What do you believe about God? That's why this world is so clueless. That's why this world is so absent of any real peace because they reject everything that is of the Lord. But what we know 
is what the Lord told his disciples that night. We fight troubled hearts by believing in the goodness of our Savior. That's how we endure suffering. By the way, let me just help you with this to to put this together too. This is also why, my friends, you must have your faith strong and settled before the turmoil comes. This is why you've got to be in the Word every day. This is why you memorize the Bible. This is why you meditate on Scripture. This is why you take time to pray every day. This is why you don't try to live any day apart from the wisdom and the strength of God's Word because before the battle hits, you need to have your heart and your mind settled in what you know and in what you believe. Otherwise, you're just going to be a wave of the sea blown Back and forth, over and over again. Read the Word. Meditate on the Word. Pray the Word. Memorize the Word. Establish your heart and your mind clearly in the truth of God's Word. And that's how you fight a troubled heart. Jesus says to them that they have believed in God before the physical presence of Christ was a part of their life, and they can continue believing in Jesus even when He's not physically going to be with them. He's going to be just as real in His absence as He has been while He's been dwelling among them. In other words, here's what Jesus is saying to them at this point. He's saying to them that you've trusted God the Father, and God the Father in His goodness sent the Son And now when the Son goes back to the Father, you still trust in the goodness of God who is never going to leave His people without what they need. Do you believe that today? Do you understand that God is providing for you? And it may be difficult to see it because you're surrounded by so many reminders of things that are broken in this world and maybe even things that are broken in your own life. But God has not left you without hope. God has not left you without direction. God has not left you without a comforter. You have in the Spirit and through the written Word all you need, the Bible tells us, for life and for godliness. Jesus is trying to help his disciples and by extension help us, the church, to understand that the Lord is always providing for us. The Lord takes care of his people. And that doesn't mean that that hardships won't come. Of course they will. But the Lord can be trusted. And he says this very well-known statement in verse 2, In my Father's house are many rooms. Just... A quick note here for you that this this word through the years has been translated in a way that's probably unhelpful. You you may have memorized this as a child. Um, My my father's house are many mansions. The the, the word here refers to dwelling places. Mansions really misses the whole point. Um, You probably, like me, grew up singing songs and hearing sermons and and hearing even lectures that say things to you like, you better be good if you want to have a a big mansion. Or, you know, you want to make sure you've got a a really big mansion in heaven with a really big yard and and, uh, all kinds of weird songs that have come out about how you can have your your big mansion. Let Let me help you with this, all right? Here's the greatness of heaven. You are in the Father's house. The greatness and glory of heaven is not some big mansion you have in some gated community where no one can bother you. (laughs) The promise of heaven is that you are at home in His house. You hear so many people talk about heaven, and to hear people talk about heaven, you don't even need Christ there. Because all they're consumed with is is their stuff. All most people do when they talk about heaven is take their dream of this life that they did not get and make it become true in heaven. That's not what heaven's about. Heaven's not about every selfish, shallow, 
earthly, worldly dream that didn't come true coming true for you then. Heaven is about you are at home in the Father's house. I was brand new in ministry, and um, at that point, I had, I had not preached a funeral yet. And a friend of mine, a, a, a man who had pastored for a long, long time, an older gentleman, was going to meet with the family to prepare a funeral service. And so I asked if I could tag along, just being brand new in ministry, wanted to, to kind of learn how you do that. I'll never forget this conversation. He sat with his family, and, and the family said to him, um, that this, the loved one who had died said he loved to play golf. His whole life was golf. He, he, every thought he had was about golf. Every waking moment was on the golf course and said, will there be golf in heaven? And I'm 20, first full-time job, and I'm formulating in my mind how I would answer that question. And this elder pastor, for whom I'm very grateful that he would allow me to be a part of this conversation and learn, said to that family, if it will take golf to make your loved one happy in heaven, then God will see to it he can play golf. And I wanted to stand up and scream and say, what about Christ? I don't know if there's golf in heaven or not, but if there is, it's not because you couldn't be happy without it. If Christ is there, you have all you need. Now, I can't speak to everything that will or won't be happening in heaven. There's so many things we can't know. But don't you find it interesting that the only thing Jesus must have his disciples understand here is that in heaven, you are home in the Father's house. That's what makes it heaven. You're with the Lord. You're in his house. That's what makes it heaven. Not all the other things that, that can be there, that, that can be something to, to do or something to enjoy, but without Christ, it's not heaven. And what so many Christians fail to understand is that heaven will be all about the glory of God on full display for all eternity. And now, with no more stain of sin, we can give him the worship he deserves and your heart longs to give. And that's going to be great. It's not about how big your mansion is. It's not about what neighborhood you live in. It's not about what car you drive in heaven. All the kind of strange, bizarre things. Jesus wants his disciples to understand this. For all eternity, you have a place in the Father's house. That's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. When Marcia and I were first getting married, we were driving around. We lived in a, our college town, and we were just weeks before we were going to get married. And um, we were talking about our life and our dreams together, those kind of things. And, and my wife said something that just has stuck with me. We've been married almost 25 years now. And Marcy said, Michael, wherever we live, that's, that's home. She said, if we live in a cardboard box, as long as we're together, that's home. And in an earthly sense, if, if somebody came to me and said, hey, Michael, I've got good news. Uh, we, we have, we've bought you a brand new house. It's going to be the, the house of your dreams, and it's going to have a, a beautiful yard, and it's going to have everything you've ever wanted, and all of your hobbies can take place right in this house, and we have built you the dream of all dream homes. Okay, that's great. Michael, it's not going to cost you anything. We've covered the expense. We'll cover the insurance. You can live in this house for free the rest of your life. All right, I'm in. And then they said, but, but one thing we probably should tell you is that uh, only you get to live there. Your wife is going to live at another nice house, but down the road just a little bit. I'm out. I'm, in, I'm out. 
You can't make it sweet enough, good enough, nice enough, big enough to get me in. Why? Because home for me on this earth is where my wife is, wherever we live, whatever the conditions. It's not home if we're not together. Well, our marriage on this earth is just but a taste of what is to come when we are forever united with the Lord. And in the Father's house are many dwelling places. And you, as a child of God, are welcomed home in the Father's house. Amazing. Amazing. He wants them to understand this truth. That not only they're going to be home in the Father's house, but there is room for them. Be encouraged, brother. Be encouraged, sister. There's room for you in the Father's house. When I was a child, I grew up, uh, my dad played uh, at a lot of different revival crusades. He played piano and organ, and so I grew up my whole life. I was in church, and I was going to crusades all the time, and I remember being, I was just a little, little bitty guy, and I went with my dad just to watch him play at this revival crusade. Some of you uh, raised in church like me may remember. Remember the old song, There's Room at the Cross for You? Anybody remember that song? Well, as a little child, that, that song messed me up one night at, during an, an altar call because the, the song says, there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for, you know those words? One. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Now, I took it very literally. And during the altar call, there were hundreds of people coming forward. While the song says, there's room for one. And as a child, I'm sort of thinking, oh my. <laughs> Whoever's coming better pray fast. <laughs> there's room for one. And there's dozens here. Someone's getting left out. Can I tell you the promise of heaven is that all who believe, no one's left out. You are welcomed in your Father's house, forever welcomed at your Father's house. This is the promise that Jesus gives us. Verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to myself that where I am. You may be also. There's a second coming. The Lord will come again. And I just want you to understand this truth, friends. I think it's good to study about heaven. I think it's good to read trustworthy books on heaven. I think it's dangerous to read untrustworthy books on heaven. And can I caution you? The books that sell the most are not ones you ought to be reading here. Be very, very careful what you let your mind be influenced by about heaven. And I just can't escape that the comfort, I mean, if I wrote a book on heaven, my, my wife and mom would buy it, probably nobody else, and it would be the shortest book in the history of literature. It would be one chapter, and the chapter would have one page, and the page would have one sentence about heaven. Here it is. I will be with the Lord. Period. That's, that's all I need to know. That's it. I trust him for the rest. It's, it's not going to be less enjoyable than the earth. It's not going to be less family than the earth. It's not going to be less worship than the earth. It's going to be everything heightened 10 billion times over. All I need to know about heaven is what Jesus has said here in verse 3. Where I am, you may be also. Do you notice that when Jesus speaks about heaven, it's, it's not so much an emphasis on the place as much as it is an emphasis on the person, him. The hope that believers have is not in the detail of what it's like, it's in the surety of who is there. Which is why one of my favorite things to do at church is to sing songs about heaven. And I say this 
seriously, and I say this with great respect, I love to watch our older, precious saints at our church when we sing songs about heaven because it's on their mind every day. And sometimes when you ask young people about heaven, it feels like this divine interruption. When you talk to young people about heaven and they think to themselves, what's the, what's the big deal about having our, our, our bodies made new? My body feels fine now. What, what's the big deal about, about uh, going to heaven? I, I'm, I'm trying to build my life here on earth. But you watch an aged saint sing about heaven that have been through the trials and they've had the highs and the lows and they understand exactly what Paul meant when he said to live as Christ and to die is what? Gain. Gain. And when they sing about heaven, they are saying, the one thing we know is I'm going to be with the Lord. So do you understand the, the case that Jesus is building here? You don't need to have your hearts be troubled because I'm taking care of you today. And even greater than that, for all of eternity for those who believe in me, you will be at home in the Father's house, that where I am, you will be also. All I need for my heart when you talk about heaven is let me ask you one question. Is my Savior there? If he's there, that's all I need. We're good. Don't let your hearts be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. We will be in the Father's house. Number two. We will praise the Son for the gift of salvation. We will praise the Son for the gift of salvation. Verse 4, you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thomas gets kind of a, a bad rap. If you've been in church at all, even if you don't go to church often, you probably know his nickname. His nickname is what? Thomas. How'd you like to be Thomas? <laughs> the only thing anyone knows about you is that you were a doubter. But can I just remind you that it, it's the very questions of Thomas that brings us some of the greatest statements of truth from the lips of the Lord. Isn't it interesting how in God's good providence, he can use even the struggles of a common man to be a blessing to the body of Christ. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This has always been true. The Lord has always been the way for his people. This was the prayer of the psalmist heart in Psalm 27, 11 that said, Teach me your way, O Lord. Isaiah 30, 21, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. The Lord has always been the way for his people. If you've ever been trying, I guess in these days with our, our cell phones, getting from one place to a new place isn't near as hard as it used to be. And in the olden days, those of you who are, you know, 30 or under will just have to take me by faith that this is really true. But in the olden days, if you're going to go to somewhere, uh, like if we were coming here to turn the Bible church to preach, if this would have been 25 years ago, Kent would have said, hey, why don't you go down here to the bridge and turn right, and there's going to be a Krispy Kreme on your left, and go two more blocks, and then you're going to see a sign, turn right, and then you're going to see a yellow sign, turn left, and then we're going to be right there on the corner, and you're driving the whole time looking for Krispy Kreme and bridges and yellow signs and the cow on the road or whatever else directions he gave me to look for. How different it is if somebody comes and says, you know what? I'll take you there. You just go with me. This is what Jesus is saying to his believers. I'll get you there. I'm the way. As long as you're with me, I'm going to take care of all the details. Church, can I just encourage you today to lift up your eyes and trust in your God. Trust in your God. He's going to get you there. He's going to see you through. He's going to take care of you and provide for you. He is the way. He's also the truth. 
This was the cry of the psalmist in Psalm 86, 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. And Christ himself is the very embodiment of truth. He says, I am the, I'm the life. This was the cry of the psalmist in Psalm 16, 11, Show me the path of life. Jesus says, just follow me. You're with me. And if you're with me, I'm going to get you to where I am going, that where I am, you may be also. We will be in the Father's house, and we will praise the Son for the gift of salvation. Let me tell you, when you get to heaven, you're not going to be confused about why you made it. You're going to know in that moment, more clearly than ever before, you're there for one reason. And that is the grace of your Savior, Jesus Christ. No one's making it to heaven and looking around and saying, look what I've done. No one's making it to heaven and saying, look what I earned. Every soul in heaven is going to have one name on their lips, and it's the name of Jesus. You have a home in the Father's house to the praise of the work of the Son. Let me show you thirdly that not only are we going to be in the Father's house and we'll praise the Son for the gift of salvation, but thirdly, we will have the help of the Holy Spirit. This is our promise we live in today, that we have the help of the Holy Spirit Verse 8, Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. I think Philip is, is considering here, he, he, needs some, he needs some view of the Father. He needs some vision of the Father. He needs some revelation of the Father, Philip is, is thinking here. He's just not sure that he can make it if... Christ is going to be gone. For three years, his, and the other disciples, his, his daily experience has been that Christ is physically with us. And Christ is talking about going away, and then he's going to come again. But the, the thing is, what, what about the in-between? It's great that he came, and it's great that he's returning, but what about that time in-between? which just so happens to be where you and I are living today, right? It's this time in between the promises. God promised He was going to send a Redeemer. And year after year after year after year after year, the people cried out, How long, O God? How long till the Redeemer comes? And then the angelic pronouncement came. Born for you this day in the city of David is the Savior Christ the Lord. God kept His word and Christ has come. But then after Christ dies and is raised back to life, He's going to ascend back up to the Father and He's promised to come again. But the struggle is this in-between time. How do we make it then? And this is the, this is the heart of the disciples here. What are we going to do? Our people have trusted that you were coming, and now you've come. Our faith is is bolstered, but now you're going away. How are we going to make it in the in-between time? And here's the answer. You'll have the help of the Holy Spirit. You'll have the help of the Holy Spirit. Verse 9. Have I been with you for so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? In other words, he's saying, you've always been able to trust the Father. You've always been able to trust the Son. You can always trust in your Lord. Always. Today, as believers, we live in this in-between. After the first coming, before the second coming. 
And so maybe you can relate very well to this question that's asked. What about now? How are we supposed to live now? And the truth is that the Bible teaches us that as a believer, you have inside of you the very Spirit of God. And He has not only given you His Spirit, He has given you His Word leading you and protecting you and guiding you and showing you you know the way, the truth, and the life because you have Christ and His Spirit continues to lead you in the truth. And if you would uh, turn for just a brief moment to uh, chapter 16. Look at verse 5. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus tells his disciples here, you don't need to be afraid. I'm taking care of you. I just want to say to you today as a church that I love dearly and as people I care about, whatever it is that is troubling your heart and whatever it is that concerns your mind, the Lord is going to see you through. The Lord takes care of His people. The Lord is taking care of His church. The Lord is accomplishing His work. The Spirit of God is actively doing exactly what He purposes to do. And just like your hope in heaven is that you're going to be with the Lord, so your hope on earth is the Lord is with you. You've not been left alone. You've not been left as orphans, Scripture says. You have a heavenly Father who is seeing you through. You have a home forever in His house. You have the Son that you will praise forever and forever, and you enjoy today the blessing of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And He tells them in verse 12, Whoever believes in Me will also do the works that I do which is just a great reminder to us as a church that we need to be about doing the work of the Lord. We looked at this um, a couple of, of uh, months ago when, when I was here that this was what nourished the Lord. What did Jesus say? He said, my food is to do the work of him who sent me. And so when Jesus prays in John 12, Father, glorify your name, he's being strengthened by that same truth, that his heart's desire is to do the work of the Father. And so it reminds us as a church, we must be doing the work of our God. You look around and you see churches that do so many things, but are they doing what the Lord's work is? That's the question for us today. Not are we busy Not are we active, and not even are people showing up. The real question for the true church today is, are we doing the work of our Father? Are we doing what the Lord's called us to do? And so Jesus said, the work that I do, you're going to keep doing it. This is not the end of the work. So what Jesus did, we do. Jesus proclaimed the gospel, we proclaim the gospel. Jesus cared about those who are broken and hurting. We care about those who are broken and hurting. Jesus shared compassion with those that he came in contact with. We share compassion. Jesus spoke the truth. We speak the truth. Jesus called people to repentance. We call people to repentance. And he was faithful even in suffering and persecution, so the church today must be faithful even under suffering and persecution. He's telling his disciples this is not the end of the work. He's also telling them this is not the end of the relationship. 
I'm still going to be with you. I'm always going to be with you. He says at the end of verse 12, greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. In other words, he says, it's precisely because I'm going to the Father and we're sending the Holy Spirit that even greater works are going to take place. Now, in what sense are the works greater? This, this is really a pretty simple thing. You're not going to do greater works in, in, in the sense of the essence of what you do. This is a very obvious thing. What's going to happen is when, when Christ is there on the earth, he and his disciples are right there in one location. Christ is going to ascend to heaven. The Spirit's going to come. The disciples are going to scatter. The gospel's going to be taken to the uttermost parts of the earth. And the work of gospel, kingdom, building, preaching is going to be spread all over the place. Isn't it amazing that every time the enemy tries to squelch the proclamation of the gospel, give it enough time, and all you see is the gospel multiplies. Isn't that amazing? That's exactly what the Lord is promising here. That it's to your advantage, it's to the world's advantage, because he has established his church, he has proclaimed the truth, he's going to accomplish our salvation, he's going to go be with the Father, he's going to send the Spirit, and now you're going to scatter, and because you scatter, the church will grow exponentially. So if you are the devil, you're sitting back saying, well, then how do we stop this? We tried to kill him when he was a baby. We tried to throw him over a cliff and he escaped. We tried to tempt him to, to disobey the Father's will. He didn't do that. We physically killed him. He rose again. He's gone. And now this ragtag band of disciples is going to get just that much more bold and courageous and they're going to turn the world upside down. Can I just remind you, if you are with Christ, you cannot be defeated. You are on the side of the conquering king. Let not your hearts be troubled. Do you believe in God? then trust His Word. You don't need to be sorrowful. You don't need to be weary. You don't need to be troubled. And it's okay if there's things you don't understand because you are not the way, the truth, nor the life. You are connected with the One who forever is. And we trust in Him. And so they're going to do not, not greater works in in kind, they're going to do greater works in the sense of they're going to be spread out, and now the gospel is going to go to all the world. And he tells them now in verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. We're told to be faithful in prayer, to pray in accordance with his will and his character. As we bring this message to a close, let me just put before you a couple of, of pairings here at the very end I want you to see. Verse 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And let me just jump down to verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Notice what he says. You believe and you do. If you believe in him, then you will do what he has called you to do. You believe and you do. And let me show you a second thing that he says. You glorify the Lord when you ask in his name. This is this is phenomenal. Sometimes we think of prayer as like some concession God's given us. I'm kind of tired of you. You kind of bother me. You're always asking me for things, but 
you know, I've already said I'll do it, so you can go ahead and pray, and I'll, 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 I'll answer some prayers. That, that's not what he says. He is glorified when we pray in the name of Christ. The Lord delights when his people pray. Do you ever sometimes feel almost guilty coming to the Lord in prayer and saying, I can't believe I'm asking for one more thing. I can't believe I'm confessing one more sin. I can't believe I'm asking for help again. God, you must be getting tired of me. Listen, he began the chapter by saying, you're welcomed in the Father's house. If you're welcomed in the Father's house, you are wanted at the Father's table. That's the promise of Psalm 23, and that's the message here in John 14. The Lord is glorified when you ask in His name. And so we pray in accordance with His will, in accordance with His character. Prayer is given to us as a means by which we become more and more like Christ. Understand that biblical prayer is part of what is conforming us to be like Christ because we are to pray in accordance with His will, His character, in a way that honors His name. And so we believe and we do, we glorify when we ask, and then finally, we love and we keep. That's verse 15. You'll get into that more next week. But if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We love and we keep. But what about today? I mean, the, the hope of this text that I preached this morning is that you trust your eternity with Christ. The hope is that you are longing for heaven, knowing that you're going to be in the Father's house. But what about today? I mean, some of you, I'm sure this morning are saying, you know what, I, I, I do trust the Lord for my eternity. I do trust that heaven is my home, but I'm trying to survive a loveless marriage. Or maybe for you, you say, you know what, I, I do trust that the Lord is going to rule and reign. I do trust He's going to get me to heaven, but... I'd long to be married, and, and I can't find a spouse. Or you say, I, I do trust the Lord of my eternity, but what about my, my straying child? Lord, I, I do trust you that you're preparing a home for me in heaven, but all of the talk of a virus and elections and threats, and it's just overwhelming me. Maybe for you, that's, that's where you are today. What about right now? Maybe for you, it's not so much a question of what am I going to do for eternity. You've got that settled. But what about today? Well, the Bible helps us here. Jesus says, and you'll look at this next week. Verse 16, I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. At the end of verse 17, you know Him for He dwells with you and will be in you. You're going to survive and you're going to make it today because the Lord is at work in you and He will forever be with you. Now, we're going to prepare in just a moment to receive the Lord's Supper together. And as we transition, I want to get your hearts and minds prepared to take the elements together. It's interesting. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus is preparing a place, but he's also preparing us. For you to have a home in the Father's house demands that your sin be paid, that your debt be settled. 
It's always interesting to me in the Gospels, whenever Jesus tells someone your sins are forgiven, the only reason he can say that is because he knows he's going to be the very one himself to pay the price for their sin. The only reason he can tell someone that they have eternal life is because he himself is going to pay the price for that sin. He knows it's going to be settled because he knows he's the one that's going to bear it. He himself will go to Calvary. And in so doing, he's preparing heaven for you and you for heaven. Heaven will be made ready for us and we will be made ready for it because of the work of Christ on the cross. My friend, every promise you cling to was accomplished, secured, and kept safe because of the work of Jesus on the cross. Amen? Amen. Lord, as we prepare our hearts to receive these elements, I pray that you would help us to more fully understand just how sweet this promise is. That we will be with you in heaven. We have a home in the Father's house. We will praise the name of Christ the Son. And even this moment, we will be sustained through the work of the Spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit. Lord, we understand that all of us in this room are sinners. And yet, through the shed blood of Christ on the cross, for those who would believe in His name and have been saved by grace through faith alone, we have been welcomed to Your family and welcomed to Your table. And for that, we give You praise. Amen.